Yeah. So welcome back to Stories in Two. Uh, I am Fiona. I'm Kira. We always do where you go first. It's just in a, the the order of things. Um, any news? How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Um, I don't really have much news actually. I on the back of last week's episode, but you remember I went to the dry cleaner with my coat. Could they fix it? Well, she I showed it to her, and she was like, "This might be a tough." fix and I was like okay and she was like because kind of given the material she was like it could <laughs> it Rick could it. melt <laughs> fuck yeah no it could melt um so like to be honest with you it was either throw the coat out or try get it fixed so even if she does ruin it like that was kind of the end of the road for the coat anyway um so any plans for the weekend or no nothing i mean after this i'm gonna go collect said coat so we shall see how that turns out and then i'm gonna go get a pedicure lovely no manicure just your toes i got that done during the week and then tomorrow i need to go do a bit of clothes shopping because i'm going to marrakesh in a few weeks for a wedding lovely have you got something to wear to the wedding no that's why i'm going shopping tomorrow. oh right okay you said clothes shopping as if you were getting a whole new like suitcase full of clothes for the holiday what's the weather like in november just for the wedding i think it should be pretty okay i'm pretty sure the climate's like warm all year round there yeah that'd be lovely but we've two weddings back to back like so we've got one wedding in marrakesh and then we've got a wedding the next weekend in ireland Oh, I thought the Irish one was beforehand. Busy, busy, so. Yeah, busy, busy bee. Um, yeah, no, I kind of, I have a couple of like dinners this weekend and then I'm off next week. I have nothing planned, but it, that'll be a like clean, excuse me, clean the house sort of week or get my life in order. We're both off. We haven't both been off all year. So that's it then reading and hopefully a bit of reading. Undisturbed nice. reading because I had a lot of work this week. And my reading yeah. fell by the wayside. I finished Magnolia Parks this morning. <laughs> I was going to finish it this morning. I've got about an hour. I've got about an hour left in it. Um, and I wanted to finish it this morning, but I had a little bit of a sleep in and then I had to go to the shop and get some food. And yeah, so I didn't get a chance before we recorded. But I do think I will finish it today. Yeah, I've about I've just less than an hour left. I'm on like 89 percent or something. And they're short chapters, so you actually, I didn't even nearly really intend to finish it this morning. And then I was kind of in bed, awake. I was like, oh, sure, I'll pick it up. And it was like seven minutes in chapter, then five minutes. I was like, oh, sure, I'll actually, I think I was the same. I probably read an hour of it today, probably Mm. where you're at now. And then next thing I was finished. Yeah. How are you finding it? Yeah, it's good. I find it a little bit irritating that they're all in love with her. I know. I found that too the first time I read it. I was just a bit like, what's so uh, special here, about her? She's not that great, do you know? And actually, the, it's weird because like the first book, I loved Magnolia and BJ, but that did kind of annoy me. The second book is Christian and Daisy Hates, right? And in that book, you're like, oh, fuck Magnolia and BJ, especially because you're getting Christian's point of view. And you're mm-hmm. like, oh, they're so annoying. And then the third book comes around and it's Magnolia and BJ. And you're like, oh, my God, I love them again. It's weird how the different points of view can give you different perceptions of them yeah yeah and then you kind of get that like even in the devil's night like or any other book Mm. that's kind of like different people's perspectives you do kind of like not really care about that other couple that you had just spent a whole book reading about and you're like I love them but like even this time now reading this one like I was team Tom now this time reading it were you yeah I don't know this time reading I was like I think I really like Tom (laughs) But first time uh, yeah. round, I was like, BJ, like he was the son to me. I was like, I love him. But yeah. this time round, I was like, oh, Tom. Yeah, it's interesting because like I was so like, if you had to pick a side, I was on Magnolia's side and I was like, he's not a good person. Well, not that he's not a good person, but he makes like stupid decisions where you're like, obviously, Beej, if you hadn't done that now, you would have actually got her back. Like you're making reckless choices. And then it just got to a point where I was like, do you know what? I can understand why he's doing what he's doing. <laughs> but this is it. She, He's claiming she's hurting him as much as he's hurting her. Like they, It does get to the point where you're like, actually, Magnolia, you're kind of playing with people here as well. Yeah, because like, yeah, fair enough. He's sleeping with loads of people, but she's getting boyfriends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's way more hurtful, I think. So I... 
Yeah, I am enjoying it. I will. <laughs> it's made me go and watch Gossip Girl. You were saying that. Yeah. So how far mm. have you got to Gossip Girl? Uh, I watched and I had like, I think I got through two episodes this morning, just like having it on in the background yeah, while I'm yeah. pottering around. She is um, Blair Waldorf though, isn't she? Oh yeah. But like, I think as I watch it on my phone as well, I can easily bring it around at me and oh, watch. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I could have it on when I'm in the shower and everything. I watch everything in the shower. <laughs> Kid. Yeah, just put it on the sink. Rest okay. it up against the hand wash. It's perfect. <laughs> Um, I'm on season one, episode 14. Oh, grand. So you only started that this week, didn't you? Yeah, I throw on a few episodes if I was doing a bit of admin and stuff. Um, And I was going to start a little series. I did actually make two notes, I think, on it. And then I gave up. Um, I have a note in my phone. Gossip Girl. All the times Dan being Gossip Girl didn't make sense. Oh, yes. And ha- ha- are there some already? Yeah, well, there were... It, I only noted one and then okay. I kind of gave up, but it was season one, episode one. Gossip Girl reported that Chuck and Jenny were getting together at the same time he was on his date with Serena. Wasn't possible. How could there he have reported go. that? No, that definitely was not a day one uh, always planned. See, I don't know, right? Because now re-watching it, I haven't watched it. I've watched random episodes. Like I'd mm. pick it back up, but I'd go straight into like season five. Or, yes. I'd go into season three or like, so this is kind of maybe my first time fully going back to the beginning and with the conscious effort of like rewatching it all. Mm. So I am kind of looking at it knowing, first of all, that that Dan is Gossip Girl, okay, spoiler alert, uh, that Dan is Gossip Girl. And secondly, I can't remember what my second point was there, but like knowing that. So you're kind of looking out for signs. So there is a lot that doesn't make sense. Mm. But there is also like some little nuggets where you could be like, oh, maybe. Oh, I missed that the first time. Right. There's like little hints of the voiceovers actually making a little bit of sense with what's happening on screen. OK, I'm just going to look up here because it's in the Gossip Girls were, was a book first. Yeah. So I'm going to be like, who was Gossip Girl in the book? So I don't know. I'm looking at it through the lens of knowing it's Dan, but there could be a million situations where they allude to it being Chuck or they allude to it being Dorota. I'm only kind of looking at it with them knowing it's Dan. Gossip Girl in the book series, the book leaves the identity shrouded in mystery. Yeah. So it was never, uh, I did think it was a shocking twist though at the time. Oh, a hundred percent. And then also, you know, with his whole kind of thing being like, it's a love letter to my friends and blah, blah, blah. Like, it wasn't always a bit of a love letter, You were awful to them. (laughs) Do you know, so I'm like, I feel like it was a little bit poorly executed. Like I wanted more explanations or I wanted more. I can't remember it, to be honest, but I don't think we got enough. Like, it was almost like. Oh yeah, and then it's Dan, and then the series ends, and that's that. How many that. S- uh, series were there? Um, I want to say six, but let me double check it. Oh yeah, six. Six, okay. Sorry, the description for the last episode. I can't remember every storyline, but like, after a run-in with Bart, Blair is concerned for Chuck's safety and devises a plan with Serena. I thought Bart died. Did he die in comp- Was he died and not dead? I'm just thinking now, did it come out that he actually wasn't dead in the end? Yeah. And he went into like... Witness protection have... or something? No, yeah, I could be I've... completely making that up, but I... <laughs> but I feel like I that make that kind of rings a bell. He Bart dies, I think, in season two in a plane crash. Something we need to look into this Bart Bass. He was such a... He was a, a gaul, wasn't he? There's a bastard mm. parent for you there now. Yeah. And then doesn't Chuck's mom come into it in like season four or something? Jesus I it would nearly be like watching it for the first time again for me because it's I think I've only watched it through once yeah same is Bart dead but Fiona I remember when it used to come out I used to come down to your house to watch it you remember no I used to come down to yours and we'd watch it yeah we used to I used to stream it on mega video yeah and I think that was it my my internet was either crap or we didn't have it or something along those lines so I used to come down and watch it in your house and I remember thinking this is the best TV show I have ever. Oh, watched. I loved it. Yeah. Loved it. So Bart's original original death was sudden and left mostly unexplained by Gossip Girl, but in a major twist, he's found <laughs> alive and well in a hotel room. 
when Chuck and the gang <laughs> investigate Diana Payne. Bart explains that he survived the car crash and faked his own death. Yeah, that was it. So there you in are. A, a major. <laughs> in a major twist. Four seasons later. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like a character no one missed is alive. <laughs> I know, yeah. It's um It's like in EastEnders when they bring back a character twenty years later. <laughs> Did you see the TikTok about um the um the shock in people uh, from people in Coronation Street when someone mentions London and it's a load of them being like <laughs> London? <laughs> I'm going yeah. to London. It's like, London? <laughs> so good. Um, but yeah, so like Magnolia Parks is very much like Gossip Girl meets Made in Chelsea. High society. Rich kids do whatever the fuck they like. No jobs. Mm. They work when they want to. Their parents are rich. They do what they like. They treat people like absolute garbage. I don't think they're that bad though. Oh, I'd say the boys. But the way the boys are with all the girls they're getting with and stuff, I'm like... Yeah, (laughs) but I also think, um, I feel like it's a nice version of that kind of snobby Chelsea Mm. people. Like, I I don't think they're that bad, actually. Like, the reason I love it is I actually think it's, I think it's funny. Like, I love the overdramatics, like, and I love, like, Magnolia, I love her whole personality. The way she is, like, there's one point... And is it Marcelli is like, um, Magnolia, can we talk in the kitchen for a minute? She goes, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, like, I don't know why, but I just found that so funny. Mm. Um, so you'll have it finished today. I, uh, oh, I'll await your final review. So I finished it this morning. Five, yeah. five big stars, second time round again. So tell me this, riddle me this. Um, mm-hmm. Book two is about Daisy and Christian. So it's actually Daisy, Christian and Julian, uh, Daisy's brother. There's three P- POVs in book two. Now, most of it is Christian and Daisy. Most of it is Daisy, really. But there is. And like book three then is Magnolia and BJ. And then book four is Christian, Daisy and Julian again is the way it works. So like I definitely didn't read book two as quickly. And there are similar sort of... Um, the storylines aren't completely dissimilar. Like Daisy has an ex-boyfriend that's like her BJ sort of a thing. Um, and Christian. And I didn't read it as fast, but when I finished it, I loved it. And what's the timeline? Are we picking up where like book one ends or is it going over the same timeline, but we're seeing it from their perspective? The same timeline. Okay. So we're the same timeline. We're seeing it from their perspective. Yeah. And like Julian is the gang lord. Like they say Christian and Joan are gang lords in this. Julian is like higher again. He's like the biggest, baddest person in like gang lord in London or whatever. Mm. Even though they don't strike me as that. But anyway, um, so yeah, it's the same timeline. So it's not until book three when it goes back to Magnolia and BJ where it picks up where book one left off. And the same thing, book four, which I didn't really like book four. I never finished it actually. It's the same thing. It's the same timeline as book three. Sometimes I think I'm like, okay, we don't need, I think it works well in book two to have the same timeline, but it didn't work well in book three, if that may, in book four, if that makes sense. Okay. But that's it. So I well, I'm going to assume review. like, well, I feel like I can kind of predict the ending of book one and then it's going to end up in some form of a cliffhanger. Will you have time today to finish it? Yeah, I bring my Kindle while I'm getting my pedicure, I reckon. Oh, grand. Perfect. Yeah. Um, And then, yeah, and I'm not doing anything this evening. Yeah, so I read that. And then also this week, I read um, another book. Well, I listened to it because I'm doing Sober October. I think I told you this. Um, mm. So I read, I wanted to read a book that was a little bit like the joys of like sober living. Fair enough, <laughs> so I was yeah. like, you know, just to kind of keep me motivated yeah. and all of that. So I ended up reading um, a book called, it's from Bryony Gordon. Have you heard of her? No. So I feel like she's a little bit like one of those like London literary heads, like a bit like Dolly Alderton or Elizabeth Day or loads of books out, loads of podcasts, like all of those kind of stuff. But she has this book called Glorious Rock Bottom. Um, And it's basically kind of her realizing that she was an alcoholic and gave up drink. But it's kind of that process of 
going to rehab and all of that like I mean not that I'm in any way <laughs> that way but like you know I just saw loads of reviews on it and I was like oh this could actually be a bit of an interesting read so um in glorious rock bottom Bri- Bryony opens up about toxic 20-year relationship with alcohol and drugs and explains exactly why hitting rock bottom for her a traumatic event and abrupt realization that she was putting herself in danger time and time again um, and how it, this saved her life. Known for her trademark honesty, Bryony relives the darkest and most terrifying moments of her addiction, near shying, never shying away from the fact that alcoholism robs you of your ability to focus on your family, your work, your health, your children, your, and yourself. And then a chink of light as the hard work begins, rehab, AA meetings, an endless, uh, tedious, painful self-reflection, a roller coaster ride through self-acceptance, friendship, love and hope, uh, to a joy and pride in staying sober that her younger self could never have imagined shining a light on the deep connection between addiction and mental health issues glorious rock bottom is a turn shocking is a turn shocking brutal dark funny hopeful and uplifting um a sobriety memoir like no other so i mean not that i honestly thought that i was in any way in that place but i was um I just thought it kind of sounded like more interesting so I read it and it was it was actually really good as like in the most sensitive way of saying that's good you know um but she kind of talks about how you know she would go out and go on these benders and she was more so like a functioning alcoholic of like being a successful journalist and she'd go on all these press trips and you know every party that she went to there was all this like free booze and then there'd be like coke and and all this stuff and um yeah just basically saying that how it kind of like spiraled out of control and then it was kind of like her realization then that she needed to go to AA and and everything but yeah I actually cried at the last chapter oh really yeah I did narrate it herself she narrates it yeah so she kind of has this realization it's at the beginning it's um where she was she told her husband um she was like right when the summer ends that's it I'm gonna give up the alcohol I'm gonna like do all this and then she said that it's like one day she's walking home and a conquer falls and then she said the fear she was like oh my god it's autumn she was like you know the summer's gonna end I don't want this and all of this and she has like this um, like panic over a conquer and then she goes on this absolute bender like as like her last hurrah if you will but anyway that's kind of like a start of her turning point and then like on the last chapter she's obviously she's sober now and she has been for like seven years or something um and she's playing with her daughter in a park and then she sees a conquer and then she kind of like talks about like how now she doesn't associate it with fear and like it's anyway all this stuff and I was actually bawling crying when like you know the kind of the turnaround yeah I was like oh my god what's wrong with me full circle moment yeah it was I really enjoyed it very good okay Um, and what did did you take anything from for yourself from it it definitely kind of because I think I do want to definitely consider giving up drinking 100% Um, I go through that once every six months I'd say (laughs) Not that I have a problem, but sometimes I'm like, I'm just not enjoying it as much as I think I want it. Yeah. And I think it kind of goes through that as well. It's like, it's just kind of talking about how actually the joy of sober living and it's very encouraging. I think if you're Mm. trying to go through a period of not drinking and rather than thinking about all the things you're missing out on. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, like. Like even last night I said it to you, I was like, oh, there's this play that I want to go to. But actually my first thought was, I think I'd be tempted to like get a wine there Mm. or whatever. And I was like, I don't really, it's probably easier not to go and do that. Um, But then it's just kind of, I don't know, I think I suppose it's about like retraining your situations and nine times out of ten it's actually the pressure from other people I think if you don't want to drink and they're like mm. oh, go on you'll drink like you'll just have one and you're like it's actually easier for me not to have any than have one and not exactly yeah what's the well you see yeah. I'm, I'm I'm a big what's the point of one person and I know that's awful like I never mm. drink at home now or anything I never have any in the house so when I go out it's because I'm going out like you're one on a bender and then I end up spending a fortune. I'm dying the next day. But I don't then, like, I never have a desire really. Like, 
when I go out drinking, it's so as a social thing, do you know? Mm. But like that, because I've started a couple of times being like, oh, I've got non-alcoholic gin or something. And I could see people being like, oh. And I'm like, do you know what it is? Because they, it's not justifying for themselves. Oh, but I'm having a drink. Basically, you're no crack unless you're having drinks with me is kind of the impression I've gotten off people. And not just for me not drinking, but just in general, I've heard of when people are like, oh, I'll go, but not drink. And everyone's like, well, I'm not going to be the only one drinking. Do you know? Yeah, it's... um. She talks about that a lot, actually, how she was the life and soul of the party. And she was like, no, I was the life of the party because I was off my head. But I actually had no soul. Yeah, she kind yeah. of like does this weird kind of um thing. And she was like, and now I can go to a party and, and have a non-alcoholic. And she was like, and I'm probably one of the quieter people in the room. But she was like, but I'm actually so much more content with that. Mm, yeah. And think about some people's lifestyles, like if her job and like stuff like that was going to events and parties there's always there's always alcohol at these things if there's any sort of evening event you might get a glass of wine on arrival or there's a bar or so I think it's so, like everyone's social life is really wrapped up in it that it must yeah. be very difficult to pull yourself away from it as well without mm. feeling like I've seen it with people who give up drinking say and suddenly their friends are like, oh, I never see them anymore because the only place they see each other is in the pub. Yeah. Do you know? But like I went to I went to the pub on Tuesday. We did our pub quiz and I just had two non-alcoholic beers. Grand, yeah. And it was absolutely fine. Like, Kira, you're up there every Tuesday, are you? Every Tuesday, yeah. <laughs> Do you know? Um, Cool, yeah. I might, you might send that on to me because... As an audio yeah. book as well, because I told you I've got an audible credit and I'm looking for a book. Maybe memoirs and I was trying to get like non-fiction ones, but I want ones that aren't fucking 23 hours. That's my problem. I'm trying to find short audio books. Well, this one's only about six hours. Um, and I listened on one. I listened on 1.3 as well. So I think you'd probably get it. You get through it a bit quicker. Yeah, I'll send it on to you. But it's called Glorious Rock Bottom by Bryony e. Gordon. If you listen to the audiobook as well, there's certain elements of it that you can hear that she's about to cry. Yeah, and she yeah, was yeah. Like, like, I'm so ashamed of these things. Mm. Um, I really, really enjoyed it, actually. And I, I think I rated it three. But it's been sticking with me. I think I could go in and like rate it a four. You might have to. If it's still with you. And look, I am partial to an old rating change, something like that. It, it's, that's why, because you don't yeah. know it's not going to stick with you until it's a week later. And you're like, I've actually kept thinking about that. Yeah. Okay, very good. So, very good. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely recommend it. And I think I might try read like an, I think I definitely read another one of her books. Um, And I think I might read like another kind of like sober living style book. Well, in the essence of Sober October, rather than just giving yeah. it up, giving up the drink for the month, do kind of go down on a bit of a wellness journey for the month. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And we did say that yeah. we would do um, like our autumn TBR for the next couple of months on today's episode, if we have any books. I The only book I have actually read was I read in Magnolia Parks. And then I actually downloaded, I got kind of good deals on books yesterday on Kindle. So I did actually download four mm -hmm. books. I'm not sure which one I'm going to start first, though. Okay. Each of them are kind of, I've kind of gone down the more kind of supernatural, paranormal, Halloween vibe books. So the first one yeah. I got was, so Olivia Blake, who wrote The Atlas Six, and what's the other one? Oh, Alone With You in the Ether. She has another book. It's called Masters of Death. Now, it came out in 2018. It's got very few ratings, though. Only 6,000 ratings. So will I read the description? Yeah, go for it. So from Olivia Blake, the New York Times bestselling author of The Atlas Six comes Master of Death, a story about vampires, ghosts and death itself. Viola Marek is a struggling real estate agent and a vampire, but her biggest problem currently is that the house she needs to sell is haunted. The ghost haunting the house has been murdered, and until he can solve the mystery of how he died, he refuses to move on. Fox Demora is a medium, and though is also most definitely a shameless fraud, he isn't entirely without his uses, seeing as he's actually the godson of death. 
When Viola seeks out Fox to help her with the ghost infested mansion, he uh, becomes inextricably involved in a quest that neither he nor Vi expects or wants. But with the help of an unruly poltergeist, a demonic personal trainer, a sharp voiced angel, a love stricken reaper and a few high functioning creatures, Vi and Fox soon discover the difference between a mysterious lost love and an annoying dead body isn't nearly as distinct as they thought. And then it just says also from Olive Blake, Alone With You in the Ether and The Atlas Six and The Atlas Paradox. So I think it sounds, dare I say, like a fun book. A fun a little fun Halloween read. kind of paranormal vampires. If there's vampires in it, I want it. Yeah. And I actually, do you know what? I think when I finished The Atlas Six, I saw the description for that at the back of the book. Like also from Olive Blake. And then I never, and I remember thinking like, oh, that kind of sounds good. And then I never actually saw it anywhere. Yeah. So I downloaded that yesterday. It was only a couple of euros. So you've probably seen this one around. And I think I got it for 86 cents. Joe Riley Sager, the only one left. Have you seen that cover? No, I've heard of her though. Yeah, so Final Girls is another Riley Sager book that I read. And that was the one yeah. where um, the main character, her she survived. Oh yeah, so Final Girls are... Like in a slasher movie, say Scream, the final girl is the girl that survives at the end. So this book was Final Girls. She was one that all her friends had been murdered by some mad killer and like a killing spree and she had survived. And then she had kind of, there had been a few other girls like her in similar situations and it went from there. It was, okay. I think I gave it three stars, but it wasn't, it just wasn't groundbreaking really. I so, think Anna read that and she, she hated it. Oh really? <laughs> Anna's big into thrillers, Yeah, I think she gave she? it, yeah, she is. And she, I think she gave it two. She was like terrible. Oh, really? Because mm. uh, I, so right. I saw her rating. I saw her rating on Goodreads and I took a screenshot and I sent it to her and I was like, not a fan. And she was like, <laughs> don't talk to me about that book. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, yeah. So this one is from the same author, Riley Sager, but I think it only came out this year. It literally came out in June. Yes. Yeah. So, and it's a 4.18 with 91,000 ratings. So, um, so the description of this one then. So, at 17, Lenora Hope hung her sister with a rope. Now oh reduced God. to a school... I know, it's a bit... Woo. Jesus. Now reduced to a schoolyard chant, the Hope family murders shocked the main coast one bloody night in 1929. While, while most people assume 17-year-old Lenora was responsible, the police were never able to prove it. Other than her denial after the killings, she is not. She has never spoken publicly about that night, nor has she set foot outside Hope's End, the cliffside mansion where the massacre occurred. Okay, so it's now 1983, and home health aide Kit McDear arrives at a decaying Hope's End to care for Lenora after her previous nurse fled in the middle of the night. In her 70s and confined to a wheelchair, Lenora has re- was rendered mute by a series of strokes and can only communicate with Kit by tapping out sentences on an old typewriter. That sounds freaky. Yeah, it does. Big, creepy mansion. Um, one night, Lenora uses it to make a tantalising offer. I want to tell you everything. It wasn't me, Lenora said, but she's the only one not dead. As Kit helps Lenora write about the events leading to the Hope family massacre, it becomes clear that there's more to the tale than people know. Shocker. Yeah, there's always a secret. <laughs> but when new details, always new details. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But when new details about her predecessor's departure come to light, Kit starts to suspect Lenora might not be telling the complete truth and that the seemingly harmless woman in her care could be far more dangerous than she first thought. That kind of sounds creepy. So maybe Riley Sager yeah. does write that sort of um, dark thriller horror movie style books. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think I got that for like 89 cents yesterday as well. Perfect. Your turn. Uh, oh, yes. So I had a book for you. So first of all, this next book, I was absolutely drawn into it by the cover. Oh, I love so, it. Yeah. I don't know. There's something about that. Cover I that feel I like need. you've shown me that before. Yeah, maybe. Um, My Last Innocent Year by Daisy Alpert Florin. Um, So I probably did talk about it before because I marked it on my one to read in February. Okay. But I do feel like I want to read it soon. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like I think I want to read it in the next few weeks. Um, it f- I think the reason I, ho- I held back on it is because it felt like an autumn read. Fair enough, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. 
So a deeply resonant debut novel about the non-consensual sexual encounter that propels one woman's final semester at an at an elite New England college. I mean, <laughs> come on. Um, into controversy and chaos and into an ill-advised affair with a married professor. It's the winter of 1998 and Isabel Ross- Rossin has one semester left at Wilder College, a prestigious school in New Hampshire with a wealthy elite student body and the sort of picturesque buildings college brochures were invented to capture. I mean, there's a lot going on here that are ticking boxes. Yeah. The only daughter of a Lower East Side appetizing store... Uh, owner Isabel has always felt out of place at Wilder and the death of her mother shortly before she arrived on campus left her feeling unmoored in a way that's proven her to shake now right as she's coming to believe she's finally found her place the fallout from a non-consensual sexual encounter with one of the only other Jewish students on campus leaves Isabel reeling enter Or H. Connolly a once famous poet and Isabel's married writing professor a man with secrets of his own always <laughs> secrets of their own um Connolly makes Isabel feel seen beautiful talented the woman she belongs to becoming the long she longs to become his belief in her ignites a belief in herself the two begin an affair that shakes the foundation of who Isabel thinks she is for better or for worse set against the backdrop of the Clinton and Lewinsky scandal my last innocent year is a coming of age story about a young woman on the brink of sexual and artistic awakening um, navigating her way toward independence while recognizing the power beauty and grit of where she came from timely and wise it reckons it reckons with the comple- the complexities of consent, what it means to be an adult and whether or not she can outrun her bad decisions. Cool. Very did well to dark academia through and through. And now I that's why I was like, it's an autumn read. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so I actually tried to get that on Audible a week or so ago. It's not available, so it's gonna be one that I think is for the Kindle. Very good. So yes. what's it called again? My last innocent year? Yeah, by Daisy Alpert Florin. And it only came out this year as well. Um, I have one more. Now, it's not... Fiona, it's not out actually until April 2024. So I might be getting ahead of myself. <laughs> My autumn TBR 2024. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Next year's autumn TBR. But I suppose like... You've added it to your TBR, I suppose. I've, I've <laughs> added it to my TBR. Um <laughs> Because I feel like I have to give a shout out because it was put onto my agenda this week or my radar, whichever way you want to put it. And it is the fact that Chloe Walsh will be releasing the next installment of The Boys of Tommen, book five, Taming Seven. Taming Seven? This is about Gibbsy and Claire Bear. (laughs) And I am... Itching. Do you know what though? Like by the time it gets to that, so that's what book five. So they'll probably be the best book. I find the later in the series when you already kind of have a bit of like you know those characters already. So for yeah. some reason you just you already have an emotional connection. So their story ends up becoming your favourite one of them. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got Gibbsy and Claire Bear. And, and they've been teetering on the edge of like all four books so far. So like, you okay. know, and what I quite liked about it is obviously you get Johnny and Shannon in the first two books and then you get um Joey and geez, I can't remember her name anymore. Aoife? The girlfriend in Aoife, that's it. Aoife Lynch. I know it's Joey Lynch. Joey Lynch. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. And then, um, so then actually when you moved on to Joey, and Aoife, in those books, you kind of see a different side to, to Gibbsy in that one. So, yeah, I think it's going to be great. But it's not out until April, but I'm going to give you a little bit of the description. Okay, so the all-new fifth book in Chloe Walsh's heart-wrenching and angsty Boys of Tom and series, following the long-awaited love story of fan favourites Claire and Gibbsy. She's the quintessential sunshine girl. He's a lovable class clown. The storm clouds are rolling in, and this Tom and boy is about to get serious. Tom and's cheeky lad, um, Gibbsy, is a comedian at heart, and underneath his happy-go-lucky nature, lures a broken boy featured, tortured by the events of his past. 
Using humour to cope with his demons, Gibbsy hides everything from the world. Only one person knows who he's who he is truly on the inside. His his best friend's little sister, his Claire Bear. Enveloped in sunshine, Claire Biggs has spent her whole life adoring the boy across the street, her brother's friend. Seeing a side to Garrod that no one else sees, Claire is determined to tame her wild at heart childhood best friend. But when she unexpectedly occur but when the unexpected occurs and lines are crossed, will Gibbsy and Claire's friendship survive? Will it blossom into something more or will they lose themselves in the riptide? Oh, Fiona. <laughs> well, look, already I love my favourite boys in romances are the happy sunshine. Joe, when you see the grumpy sunshine, but the guy is the, sun, the sunshine and the girl is grumpy. Yeah. Like him, like I'm sure he, it could join like their shameless flirts. I love it. Like yeah. I am, I already know Gibbsy would be my favourite in that series. Yeah. Just from reading that. So that's yeah, April. That's April 2024. So they're just very long books. I think that's why I know and I have the first one and I'm sure like there's no way everybody loves those books and I wouldn't actually love it if I gave it a chance. It's just very daunting the size of it. I think I need to read the first one because I think once I read the first one, I'd be in then. Are the numbers all the boys like rugby jersey numbers? Is that where that comes from? Like binding 13, keeping six. Um, So, yeah, I think with um, the first one, it is it's Johnny's rugby jersey. And then in the second one, it's Joey's hurling jersey number. Oh, he's a hurler. Love that. He's a hurler. Yeah, he's a hurler. (laughs) Um, so they're getting all the sports in. Have you another? Um, let me have a little look. I think it was just that one, to be honest. The other one, like I have other ones, but they're not ones that I haven't spoken. I've not not spoken oh, yeah. about them before. So I have. Um, I feel like I haven't told you about. No, I think I have the Burnham Burnham Wood one is probably the next oh, one for yes. me. Oh yes, that kind of is a bit um got kind of spooky mystery style um air about it doesn't it yeah it does actually i did buy a new book the other day i can tell you about this one hold on go on so i went down to the charity bookshop the other day shout out to the red cross um and i just picked this up and it was it's an author that i've i feel like i've read yeah i have read a few of her books before louise o'neill after the silence oh yes i know that you may yeah, you may have seen this one. Now, I've seen this before and I didn't pick it up, but Fiona Two for two fifty <laughs> in the charity bookshop. I mean, you can't. You can't leave it. it. No, I know. Even if I was to get it on the Kindle, if I saw it for that cheap, I'd still pick it up. Exactly. So um, Louise O'Neill, she is an Irish author, but um, I feel like this is maybe falls into the autumn TBR. So Nessa Crowley's murder has been protected by silence for 10 years until a team of documentary makers decide to find out the truth. On the day of Henry and Keelan Kinsella's wild party at their big house, a violent storm engulfed the island of Inish Ruin, um, cutting it off from the mainland. When morning broke, Nessa Crowley's lifeless body lay in the garden, her last breath silenced by the music and the thunder. It was impossible to get off the island that night. The killer couldn't have escaped in its ruin, but no one was charged with the murder. The mystery that surrounded the death of Nessa remained hidden, but the islanders knew who to blame for the crime that changed them forever. Ten years later, a documentary crew arrives there to lift the lid off the Kinsella's carefully constructed lives, determined to find evidence that will prove Henry's guilt and Keelan's complicity in the murder of beautiful Nessa. In this bold, brilliant, disturbingly new novel, disturbing new novel, Louise O'Neill shows that deadly secrets are devastating to those who hold them close. Irish backdrop. Irish backdrop. Um, a secret, a mystery, a secret, a long secret, if you will. A, a, a tightly kept secret. What did it say? Ten years. Ten years of a Very creepy good. little town. Although it's um, a hardback book, Kira. Yeah, but I don't mind that. That's true. I do not mind that. That for me. Let's look at some of the reviews. Oh, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> Marion Keys said, elegant, assured, gripping and moving. It's her best book to date. And that's really saying something. Elizabeth Day, after the silence is gripping, clever and beautifully written. O'Neill has a gimlet eye for the telling detail. Chillingly good. 
Liz Nugent, who wrote um, Strange Sally Diamond. You should read that, actually. This is a superior psychological thriller, absolutely gripping, intriguing and superbly written, a compulsive read. And Cecilia Hearn, um, I raced through it guessing until the very satisfying end. All I thought of there was someday, Kira, it will say stories in two and it will be one of ours on the back of that book. <laughs> I know. Well, it will. But I... I think Louise O'Neill is a bit of a darling in the Irish literary... Uh, circles as well i've read a few of her books i think i think uh let me go on and have a look i haven't read any you have you definitely have because you've spoken about them oh yes almost to love uh, and asking for it yeah i've read two of her books and i actually really enjoyed those two yeah so i'm going back for a third i do think i'll read this well i i'm like i'll read it soon it'll be about it'll be season six and i'll be like yeah, so yeah. i've just started after the sign fuck it sure but we're mood readers sometimes you're like you've great intentions what I find you've great intentions while you're reading a different book and then you finish that book and you're like maybe I won't read this one I know I feel like um well look let's be it's called a spade a spade now I'm probably gonna go on second magnolia or the daisy hates book and you know I'll probably stay in that do you think you will yeah probably I'd say so I mean, because I'm they in are the long and they're long enough, though. They're not short books. Yeah, but like, what's long? Well, they're five hundred pages. Yeah, but that's fine. Oh, I, I don't. Right. I wouldn't consider that a very long book. I think it's long enough, but yeah, no. Like to me now, if it was a thousand pages, I'd be like, that's more daunting. Well, <laughs> obviously, yeah. But um, I got one other book then um yesterday when I I had had it on my TBR. And I actually got it for, I think, three pounds on the Kindle. So it's the third of the ones I downloaded yesterday. So it's called The One by John Mars. Yeah. So it's 4.11. When did this come out, actually? I think it's, so it came out in 2018. So how far would you go to find The One? A simple DNA test is all it takes. Just a quick, quick mouth swab and soon you'll be matched with your perfect partner, the one who you are genetically made for. That's the promise made by Match Your DNA. A decade ago, the company announced that they have found the gene that pairs each of us with our soulmate. Since then, millions of people around the world have been matched, but the discovery has its downsides. Test results have led to breakup of countless relationships and upended traditional ideas of dating, romance and love. Now, five very different people have received the notification that they've been matched. They're each about to meet their one true love. But happily ever after isn't guaranteed for everyone, because even soulmates have secrets. Poor secrets. I think we've got a bit of a. I think we've a bit of a theme this episode, Mm. Um, and some are more shocking than others. A word of mouth hit in the United Kingdom. The one is a fascinating novel that shows how even the simplest discoveries can have complicated, uh, complicated consequences. So I don't know how I came across that. I think sometimes I come across something on. Do you ever find that if you come across a video on TikTok of a book that you've never seen before, so you're Mm -hmm. instantly interested in it? Yeah. I was like, oh, I don't know that one. And then I looked it up and I did actually kind of like the premise of that. It's kind of a Black Mirror style um, uh, premise, which I find is always uh, an interesting kind of dynamic. So that's the Mm. third one. I think I paid three pounds for that on the Kindle. So what did you say that was called? It's called The One by John Mars. Okay. Um, Totally original, smart and thought provoking. And it's now a Netflix original drama. There oh. you go. Okay. I don't even think I've seen that on no, Netflix. No, neither have I. So that would be my final. Uh, well, it's the last of the three I bought yesterday. So I think I might start with. Actually, I might start with that one. And then I'll go into the Masters of Death, the Olive Blake one. Are you not going to stick with me on my Daisy Hates journey? I was thinking about it. Yeah. I'll see. Yeah. Because I did finish Magnolia, but I might try and read something in between. I could be itching for itching for more. Yeah, you could be. Any more honourable mentions for books or um, any coming out this year? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm purely on 2024. Um, well, do you know, another one, obviously, on the back of last week's episode will be the second. Oh, of course. Fourth wing, like Iron Flame. That's obviously going to be a big one for us. Well, for me, maybe that's not you. That's in November. I'll but read yeah. it anyway. Yeah. So I suppose that's kind of an honourable mention. Lovely. 
The only other one I have that I downloaded because I got it on Kindle Unlimited. I don't have to go through the whole description or anything in it. But um, The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches. So I think it's supposed to be kind of like a cozy rom-com sort of. Like the X-Hex. X-Hex. Yeah. Is what I get. As the first sentence is a warm and uplifting novel. So there you go. Okay. Yeah. And it's got... 4.17 out of 93,000 ratings. And I did get that on Kindle Unlimited. So that is also on my Kindle. Lovely. Lovely stuff. Um, okay. Will we wrap it up? I think we should. Um, follow us on all our socials. Instagram, TikTok, Stories in 2. Email us at storiesin2 at gmail.com. Um, if you did like Fourth Wing, go back and listen to our book club episode. We did that last week. Come mm-hmm. back next week for more book chats. Let us know what's on your TBR. Let us know what's on your TBR. Book or, or ones you've read that you've loved that you think we should read. Yeah. Always looking for recommendations. Yeah, share the recs. Exactly. Okay. It was a nice chat. She's okay. Yeah, you too. And I will talk to you soon. Bye.